Today, with another episode, nay, the return, the great resurrection of the one, the only, the greatest podcast to ever be called Movie Loaf. It's Movie Loaf. Uh, we're back after a very long hiatus. Um, I say we're back. I've never had like a, a like a, a dedicated co-host, but uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna have a, a semi-dedicated co-host now. Um, and that is the one and only from, from, you, you know, the, the, the thing with the, the smells like the vinegar and then it's got the syndrome and the film dies and then everybody's really sad because they're a bunch of film nerds. Uh, the one and only Brad Henderson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to be part of the movie love. Yay. Uh, yeah, I pulled, I pulled, man, you guys, you should be happy. I like, I pulled this out of my back pocket. I was like, you know what? I'm going to make Brad do my my mother trucking bidding and I'm going to be like, "Yo dog, you're going to be on this podcast." And then he called me up before I ever could have actually said anything and he was like, "Hey, I'm going to be on the podcast." And I was like, "Oh shit, cucked." Uh and uh yeah, here we are. Uh and this is this is very special. Um we've been talking about this for a while. We were god, how we were, we uh, we're going to record this weeks ago and it kept falling through. We were going to do it last week. It fell through, and finally, here I am. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm in an Airbnb. It's raining outside. There's traffic right outside the window. My in-laws are here. Uh, everything's uh, wild and crazy. My camera quality sucks, rancid dick holes. But, but we're finally recording, and that's all that matters. That's all that fucking matters. And today, uh, who, who, well, c Brad, can you explain... Uh, this particular uh, loaf that we will be putting together, this uh, multi-tiered, uh, epic, uh, probably like a bajillion episode long loaf. What is it? Yeah, so um, I had this idea a while ago just because obviously I, you know, I, I love Tarantino. I love, I love Kill Bill. Um, but what I love a little bit more than all that are all the films that Tarantino has lifted from, uh, or homage, whatever you want to call it. Um, and in Kill Bill, there's countless, <laughs> like 70, 70 films of like little things, like even just like a music cue or a character or a shot, um, just something, you know, that's something that he has been inspired by to make. And I thought it'd be really cool to do a whole series on the films that he has grabbed a little bit from. Whether it's a music cue or a shot, we're gonna be talking about those films and not Tarantino at all or Kill Bill, just these movies that he's been inspired by. So this is not a Kill Bill podcast, but it kinda is. This is what you get for fucking around with Yakuza's! And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Kill Corbucci. Let's do it, R roll the theme song. Mongo, my sweetheart, you don't know how much I love you. Who do you suppose be able to kill that renegade? Me. More price. <laughs> There's uh, three, three films um, that we have have uh, kind of brought together. Um, two that are very, very similar, and then one that is not, but it was obviously made around the same time, and one of my favorite Corbucci films, and also one of my favorite moments, one of my favorite scores, really, uh, in Navajo Joe. By the way, guys, full spoilers on this. These movies are very 
there's like 60 years old. You, if you haven't watched them already, I, I don't know what to say. But also, I would dare say they are unspoilable um, because these are just like your straight up fun wackadoo spaghetti westerns. A lot of Sergio Corbucci's work, I think you could potentially spoil. You could, you know, uh, I think Django, I think my son is like bashing the door. <laughs> Oh, well. Um, Django, for example. Uh, by the way, guys, if you're just tuning into Movie Low for the first time, it gets much more professional from here. It's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. I'm in an, a noisy Airbnb. Anyway, um, so like Django, for example, I think there's elements of that that you could spoil for people. I think The Great Silence, you could definitely spoil. I think that that's one of those endings that you really need to see fresh because it just like hits you like a ton of bricks. But these three, these three are special because they are just... Corbucci, I would say having the most fun, at least as far as the final product goes. Uh, these are Navajo Joe, The Mercenary, and Compañeros, which are three, Brad, of your favorites from Corbucci. Who do you think you're fooling? You're stupid to trust him. Out of all of them, Navajo Joe is, is by far, I mean, one of my favorite Westerns, one of my favorite revenge films. Like, if you encompass everything that Navajo Joe has, it's just, I think it, it really is perfect, even with the bad rap that it has gotten through the years for stupid reasons. Yeah, I know Alex Cox. I was actually, I was going to reread the chapters in Alex Cox's book on these three films, and I completely uh, negated, I neglected to do so because um, on vacation, uh, hence the fun pineapple shirt that the podcast listeners can't see. Yeah, I remember he, like, just, just like, takes Navajo Joe, crushes it in his British hands, and just shoves it in a grinder and just, like, makes 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 uh, burger meat out of it. Like, he really doesn't like Navajo Joe in that book. And I actually read that before I revisited Navajo Joe. I could, for the life of me, I couldn't remember much of anything about Navajo Joe. I remember, like, little things. I remember the score, obviously. I remember Burt Reynolds and his fright wig. But I, I wasn't, it wasn't like stuck in my memory. And so I read that piece in Alex Cox's book and I was like, man, what, oh, this is going to be a, this is, is this going to be a slog? Like, am I forgetting how bad this was? And nay, I actually forgot how great it was. I don't think I like it as much as you do, but I think it's probably the most, I guess, digestible of the Corbucci Westerns that I've watched. Like, it's the one that just feels the most like, we're gonna have a fun time. Like, the, he does have a bit of a message there uh, with the um, the scalping plot um, and that amazing moment where, uh, where Navajo Joe explains that actually, Whitey, <laughs> uh, this land is my land. So how about you, a uh, fuck right off? Which is actually probably one of my favorite moments in a Corbucci Western now that I've, re I've watched the movie um, twice more. Where was your father born? What has that to do with it? I said, where was he born? Uh, in Scotland. My father was born here in America. His father before him and his father before him and his father before him. Now, which of us is American? You're much better as a historian than I am. Um, you know, like, everything there is to know. And you're also, you've probably seen this movie more times than you can count, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I first I first saw this uh, when I was younger. Yeah, and it was just something that stuck with me because, you know, you always hear as, you know, a kid, you play cowboys and Indians. And, you know, that's kind of how these movies are somewhat presented at times when, you know, now we say spaghetti westerns or whatever. But a lot of times, you know, you just watch cowboys and Indians on film. That's That's like, that's what it was called. And, and it's just like, I'm so glad we have kind of moved away from that because this is one of those films where the cowboys are actually the really, really bad people. And it's, you know, your Native Americans that are the good people that are trying to survive. And like you said, you know, when they're at that bar and he's trying to say, I'll protect you. But, you know, he's like, he, I think one of the lines is like, hey, where are you from? And he said, what does it matter? And he says, where are you from? And he's like, I think he says like Scotland or something. And he says, I was born here and my father and his father and his father and so on. And it was like everybody out there is like an immigrant coming into their land. And it just, I don't know, it's it, it really is kind of this message that is being sent that I think is just kind of overlooked because it's known as this kind of wonky 
film that Carbucci did, and then Burt Reynolds has completely trashed the movie through the years. The reason why I guess I'm kind of perplexed by the negativity is that you have one, you have Corbucci directing the picture. You have Morricone scoring the film. Probably one of his best scores, like to date. I can't think of something that has such an impact. The, the score plays like throughout, like all the time, like it, and, and it, and it, and it changes too. Like it always reminds me. And obviously they didn't, I don't think that this was in his mind, but Robert Rodriguez does something similar in planet terror with his score. He has different versions of it that play at different moments. So if it's a very calm, he has this theme that plays throughout, but it's the actual big theme of the, of the film. And in Corbut, uh, uh Morricone does that in this too. And I just think that that's unbelievable. Um, and then also uh, <laughs> DeLeo wrote the script, you know? And so you have like this powerhouse of people behind it. Also Diodato was assistant director on the film. And it's just, it's just one person right after the other. Um, just a, just a really great, group of people really great barrage of people that just come together to make this kind of brutal uh film so yeah i just i i can't kind of get enough of uh and plus the cast with you know uh burt reynolds and and um Sambrell, like oh my god Sambrell Sambrell being, Sambrell you fucking know, dominates. The, the the villain in this movie is just insane fernando ray um, who it shows up in a lot of these things, but he 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 plays a good role. It's just it's just a multitude of things that kind of bring this film together that just makes it like kind of the ultimate powerhouse, and it's kind of brutal too. Oh yeah, and we don't really get that too much in westerns. I mean, it uh, starts with a the murder and scalping of a native woman. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's just like I remember seeing that for the first time, and and just thinking like yikes you know you really get to kind of see this really dark part right off the bat like it doesn't waste any time yeah people like uh, they, they bring up the the fact that burt reynolds you know a white guy um i don't care how many how much what percentage he said he was like a white guy um playing and <laughs> playing a native american and that obviously especially in our day and age that you know a lot of people cannot get past that um i know i i, yeah. I was watching it with a friend for the third time and uh, he w- he could not get past Burt Reynolds in his wig. Of course, he also couldn't get over the it's, dubbing. So, you know, he wasn't really the, the best audience it's, for it. It is but. one thing that is like the deterrent to the film is how awful his his wig is. And also him being a, a white guy. Yeah, like I know, think he does a Native American. He does a good job like in yeah. the role. Like if you take away those factors, he's very good. But he is definitely uh, handicapped by you know the fact that he's a white dude the fact that he's not quite where he would be in his career eventually like as far as like his um you know charisma it's still there but it's not it's not evolved yet you know the stash hasn't given him his powers and he's not he's not quite there but he's also playing a character who is sort of a strong silent type man a few words and when he does talk he does have enough power behind them partly thanks to DeLeo's pretty fucking sick script but the fright wig does does hurt things. And I think it's just hard for people to get past it. But it is kind of crazy to think about like the same people, like the people that are going to malign it for that reason, uh, overlook the fact that it has a very anti-settler, uh, you know, settler, anti-cowboy message to it, where it is very much like, it's their land. And guess what? We sent out bounty hunters to fucking scalp them for, for money. And there's more where these came from. <laughs> I don't know why. I guess I just, I wasn't really considering it too much when I first watched I don't know what, like I watched it like back in like 2018, 2019 for the first time. And I didn't really think about it too much. And then this time I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta square up. I gotta, I gotta meet Brad in his, his zone. I gotta really pay attention and like dig in here. And I didn't even have to really do that. I just was watching. I was like, holy shit, this is so good. There's like a little, a few things that are kind of funny watching it. Uh, like the fact that, like, I love that they've put so much budget towards 
uh, this massive bunch of, of bounty killers, this huge gang led by uh, Sam Burrell. It feels like there's hundreds of men on horseback. And they all go and they attack a train with two cars. I, I don't know if that was a budgetary thing, if it's meant to be like the idea that it's supposed to be small because they're carrying this, you know, precious cargo. I, I don't know what the deal is, but um, there's like little things that maybe betray, not even betray the budget, but make it feel a little cheaper, um, like the train, the fright wig. And maybe that also affects people's perception. But I mean, when you compare it to what we're going to talk about in a second, the mercenary and compañeros, like it's right up there with them. And they're at very least the mercenary. I think the mercenary is the one that's considered uh, better by folks. I don't really know. Like they're pretty equal to me, but I know that there's one that people. Yeah. Prefer. I mean, as far as like these three, yeah, I think the mercenary actually, no, I think compañeros is probably like more like light. Um, but Honestly, like those two films are so similar in tone, and we'll get into that. Yeah. But I mean, essentially, same cast, same filmmakers. Like they made them back to back practically. You know, it just it's 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 very you just similar all around. I, I think well, what you said with 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 uh, you know your your uh, your bad guys. Uh, yeah, as far as the men, like I mean, it's right off the bat that we have. You know, after his wife uh, is is scalped, you know, we have uh, while the scalping's happening, the, the the soundtrack you know kicks in. And uh, while the credits roll, we literally have uh, all these men basically trotting down this stream while the credits roll. And it's just, you're right. It's just like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> how many people are there? And immediately, you know, right after the credits roll, uh, you know, we have uh, Navajo Joe uh, just going right at it. Oh, yeah. Like, he is tracking these people down. Damned Indian. It really is this revenge film that sets it up within the first couple minutes and then starts paying off immediately after. It's probably you know, the he's most hunting lean. all these people down. It's a, it's an exceptionally lean film because it it just it starts with the murder and the scalping. Um, you get that theme that everybody knows from Kill Bill at this point, at the very least. And then, uh, which by the way, even though it's one of his best themes. Uh, Morricone, not credited <laughs> as Ennio Morricone. Right. Uh, yeah. Recorded Leo Nichols. Leo Nichols. I, yeah. find that, I just found well, that really funny. Well, that's everybody. That was, that was everybody because, you know, with one of the names we've left out is De Laurentiis uh, yep. produced this film. So when he was producing the film, he was promising everybody um, that this is going to be like the good, the bad, and the ugly. They were expecting this movie to be huge. Um, and with the name changes, they gave everybody uh, just very generic, you know, uh, American names um, to try to pass this off. But shit, the movie didn't even open up in the U.S. until like a few years later. I want a dollar a head from every man in this town for every bandit I kill. Plus the reward that's been offered for Duncan and his brother. Navajo Joe was made in 66. It premiered in 67 but actually didn't make it over here until the 70s you know this was just a low budget attempt of de Laurentiis thinking that he's going to make this big movie being off the success of you know kind of burt reynolds uh you know up and coming this is his second lead movie and he's already kind of you know he was obviously in uh he played you know in hawk and he was in tv shows and kind of a regular on tv shows and they were just expecting this to be huge but there was just so many like bad things that were happening like behind the scenes. I mean, Burt Reynolds, uh, the joke is, is that he thought this was Sergio Leone that was making this film. That's what he was told. Actually, Corbucci wasn't even set to direct the movie at first. Um, and then he came in. It wasn't Leone anyway. It was somebody else. So, you know, Burt Reynolds was pissed off because, you know, Sergio Leone was making these grand films that were huge hits in the u.s alone like making these spaghetti westerns in, in the u uh, and in, in italy so when all that crossed over uh there is just kind of some bad blood 
um, there. And from what is told uh, from word of mouth, uh, passed down and passed down, and my own experience talking to Burt Reynolds about Navajo Joe is he really, really hated Corbucci. They did not get along. They had constant problems. I didn't hear that part from Reynolds, but Reynolds was at a convention, and I just took it upon myself to ask him about this. So I stood in line for, I don't know, an hour. (laughs) <laughs> Why all these people were having Smokey and the Bandit shit, like, you know, like Gator and all these other films, like for him to sign. I didn't have anything to sign. I just wanted to ask him, Navajo Joe, like, what's up? You know, <laughs> Bert isn't even in like the room with all the other people. He's like by himself, obviously, because he has a lot longer line. So like he's like in this hallway. And I think they have like the Smokey and the Bandit car there, too, or a replica or whatever. And like Bert is doing like his like arm over the shoulder, over the chair. He's got those, you know, signature glasses on and he's like doing this. And, you know, I went up and the people that are like, ask like, where's the money? And I'm like, I don't have anything to sign. I just wanted to meet Mr. Reynolds. It's like Mr. Reynolds, you know, I'm a huge fan of Navajo Joe. And it's like, (laughs) <laughs> get the fuck out of here you know <laughs> like i was like all right well i was like i just wanted to tell you i really like the movie and he was like motioning for the next person to like come up so even after what like you know 50 years literally 50 years he's still but he was still bitter about this movie and it's and it's insane because like what i'm saying is like there's such a powerhouse of team of filmmakers i mean we mentioned to leo so Hugo Piero and uh, Piero uh, Regnoli. Re- Re- just Re- as I got Regnoli. it. Just as I had it. Regnoli, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Piero Regnoli uh, co-wrote the script with DeLeo and, and Hugo. Regnoli was one of Fulci's writers. Uh, so so Re- Regnoli wrote a bunch of Fulci scripts. All the, Both of these guys. I mean, from, from black exploitation films that were, you know, made in the U.S. to the, you know, Italian cinema. These, the, like, they had a full team. They had good writers. These just aren't, like two guys that co-wrote with DeLeo. DeLeo uh, is the one that came up with the hard-hitting stuff. You know, he's the one that came up with this story with Corbucci that made this kind of a more brutal, like, slang, because that's what DeLeo was known for, is his his, his Euro Prime movies. You know, is like, shoot first, you know, die later, kidnap, syndicate, all that stuff. So, you know, his movies always pack a punch, and that's where the punch comes from. Navajo Joe and then you have basically these you know other two writers that are kind of filling in the gaps DeLeo doesn't have a lot of dialogue in his films and if they are they're very police procedural-esque so this was more or less the you know their take on West you know because they've already written the you know uh, spaghetti western or westerns at the time spaghetti is the you know budget portion but they were writing westerns at this time so you know it's the powerhouse team of, of people in this film and you have Burt Reynolds who's also doing his own stunts in the movie because he was a you know a stunt man uh when he was younger so uh and all the way up into his TV career so you know he's he's doing all his own stunts he's doing stunts for other people as the stunt man and then he has this amazing sequence which I people need to talk about more is that he's literally hanging by his feet and he raises himself up all in one scene, just one shot. He raises himself up and gets out of this hanging just by his feet. The amount of strength that you have to have in order to do that. There's no cut after he gets out of it. He literally is hanging there, pulls him himself up, does this uh, circus Olay thing where he's taking his legs out of these ropes and then gets up on like this, you know, wooden plank thing, and then eventually gets out of what he's, you know, uh, you know, been captured. Again, just so many things that add up to being this badass movie yep. that Navajo Joe is that people just kind of like think, oh, Burt Reynolds didn't like it, so it's just this trash spaghetti western. And talk about a fucking body count. And this body count is in like close to maybe a hundred. 
it kind he of it, 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 it almost explains why Bert, I mean there's several reasons why Burt Reynolds didn't like it but I you know he he mentions whenever he talks about the movie that he killed like what you know I think he says like 200 or 300 you know people and he's not that far off like it does seem like he probably kills roughly that yeah. many people uh and I love the story that uh Corbucci just shot him on the there's there's a scene if you haven't seen the movie where he is just like throwing, uh, I guess, dynamite um, at all these bad guys in town. He's up on this roof uh, and he shoots them. He throws dynamite, does all this stuff. And basically, Corbucci just shot him on this rooftop um, or a facsimile of a rooftop uh, and had him just throwing stuff and shooting and, and, you know, just doing it again and again and again. And then for a few weeks, I guess, they, in this little Western town, uh, which there's, you know, several in Spain uh, that they used for these um, films. Uh, just blew fucking shit up and threw stuntmen everywhere and everybody's just flying and getting shot and falling off of stuff. And, um, which, you know, pro tip for aspiring filmmakers out there, that's called montage. And montage, it's the key to all filmmaking. Sergei Eisenstein. Okay, learn it. It's funny because Corpucci would always talk about how he didn't want to make any more Westerns. And I think there's that famous quote, um, I don't even remember what it's from, but it's, like, um, oh, I, I hate Westerns. I, I don't want to do any more Westerns. Oh, what are you, what are you doing next, Mr. Corbucci? <sighs> Another Western. And he just kept making them. And you know what? He was fucking good at it. Um, and that is very evident here in Navajo Joe. It's very, like, as I said before, it's very lean. Uh, it starts literally with the scalping. And then we get the sexy-ass music. And then you have the gang. And there's not like, it It kind of just, it doesn't hold your hand. It's just like, look, it's native lady died. Here's a native guy-ish. Here's a gang of bad guys. You saw Sam Burrell. He has the fucking eyebrow. And immediately have Navajo Joe showing up. Kills one right off the bat, maybe? And then they send two guys. One has an eye patch, so like one and a half guys, to, to get him. And then he returns those two men on a horse uh, dead. Uh, which is the most baller thing in the world. And the whole time, you have Marcone's score just fucking, just, just, just jamming your butt. Uh, like, just jamming your butthole with that score. It's like, uh, if you want, if you want good, like, driving around, ready to just beat up a motherfucker, that's the music. <laughs> it's on Spotify. Check it out. Uh, by the way, Aldo Sambrell's character's name is Duncan. Um, and he has a brother who's also a Duncan, but I, I don't remember the difference in the names. Uh, well, they only want two hundred dollars for him. Oh, Dun yeah. Duncan is a thousand dollars on his head. Yeah, that was. And then, then, then he takes. I remember that one sequence where they see, like, they go into town because they have the scalps, and uh, they have wanted posters, and it's like, "Hey, Duncan, you and your brother are up there," and he like goes up to his brother's like wanted poster, and he takes it, and he like crumbles it up and throws it down, and he takes his nicely, and he folds it like he's going <laughs> to keep it. And they never, like, revisit that, but that's just something that he's, like, keeping this memento, and then he's like, you know, they're going to pay. Like, they're coming in this town to, like, kill these people yeah. because and, they're wanted, well, you know. And, and they're wanted because they are, not because they're doing, like, because they're, it seems like a gang that just does, like, anything that's illegal. Um, yeah. Because right after this, they're going to go rob a train. But in this moment, what they're being wanted, they're, what they're wanted for is they're scalping Indians. And more importantly, they're not scalping the bad Indians. Because, you see, here's the thing. It, you can scalp an Indian if it's a bad Indian. If it's a good Indian, you know, one that keeps the peace, doesn't, you know, get off the reservation, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, don't, you, can't, you can't be killing good Indians. Uh, and they're killing good Indians. And that's one thing I really love is, like, no one, no one is likable in this movie except for uh, Navajo Joe. And I forgot her name but his sort of not really love interest. but uh, like his, Yeah, it's not. It's the closest his, thing to a love yeah. interest yeah. is uh, Miss Machiavelli. And she so. uh, famously did not feel like she really had anything to do in this movie. And you know what? Fair enough. She really doesn't. <laughs> she She's there to serve a purpose, and it's a very simple, specific purpose, and that is to give Joe someone uh, who relates to him, someone who doesn't think he's just a low ranking piece of shit in the grand grand scheme of life uh who's not racist against engines which it seems like almost everyone else is minus like basically only the scum oh 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 they're not the only uh likable ones there's the um uh the guy fernando ray's yeah fernando ray's character there's fernando ray's character and then there's the guy who um 
uh, leads the the dancers. The um, I'll do it alone. This is no job for women. He does the cool thing with the violin or whatever, or the fiddle or whatever, and you know, mm-hmm. pops the balloons or what have you. Yeah, as, as is, far as like main characters, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all just shitty white yeah, dudes I mean, and shitty even white ladies. The people that are for Navajo Joe still, you know, he still faces racism with like, why do we need you know an Indian to protect us? Yeah, he comes and into town like, to this town where they don't have any guns. They don't. They don't. They can't defend themselves. He's obviously a badass because he saved this train. And they're like, well, what are we supposed to do? He's like, well, you could kill Duncan. I mean, I, I, I could do it. And they're like, <laughs> we, we don't need the help of some Indian. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's, but that, I think that just gives the movie another level of charm, just showing kind of like how inept these people really are if oh, they beautiful. needed to actually do, do any kind of fight. So Corbucci worked with uh, Alejandro. Ulua, I believe is how you pronounce it. So he was his DP for for years. And uh, also he shot the mercenary and companeros. But the cool thing about Navajo Joe is he got uh, Epitoli to shoot it, which also he shot the Great Silence. Oh, wait, I can do this. I can but, do this. Yeah. Silvano Ippoli. Silvano Ippoliti. Silvano Ippoliti. Yeah. There we I- go. I- Ippoliti. Uh, yeah, that's how you say it. So he shot the great silence uh you know he also shot um Caligula. Uh, lsd L- lsd flesh of devil is okay. is the name of it so he shot that shot the howl shot uh the iguana with tongue of fire so the cool thing about having this new uh not new but working with his dp is that aleandro was good but he used a lot of zoom ins zoom outs like Ippolini knew how to set that camera back in like there's so many shots that look like a painting because he's grasping all this land. And I think that's also very important because it is the land of Navajo Joe that they're in. You know, this is his world. So the the wide shots that are in this movie are, are, are absolutely breath. I mean, we catch it right off the bat. I mean, with with the wide shot of all them, you know, trotting through the river. Uh, and then as soon as the credits are done, we're giving these great landscapes of, you know, this, uh, this, you know, mainly Alamira and, and other places around Spain. Uh, but yeah, these just beautiful landscapes and, and it, it, it believe he was just so great at what he did. And it's just, and it's, and it's neat. Cause he also, he also ended up, um, doing, um, he became the DP for, uh, Tinto Brass. Oh, oh yeah. Well, he was he also, Caligula. Yeah. He also became the the DP for for Tinto Brass. He, I think he shot Caligula mm-hmm. and Salon Kitty. He may have shot the Key as well. I don't know. I'm making things up at this point. Um, but I know he did shoot for Tinto Brass. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, Ippoliti was a, a, a great. Um, I mean, obviously they worked together for the Great Silence, which I think you know is you probably think the Great Silence is kind of one of his. You know, Corbucci's masterpiece. The Great Silence might actually um, be like, it's in, it's in my like top three westerns of all time. Yeah, um, and it's just like all, all those things added up together. That is more or less like the the the, the movie that was going to be you know the good and the bad and the ugly or once some time in the West. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, no, I think Navajo Joe is just it's it's just a low budget movie spaghetti yeah. western. There and I, you go. I didn't even but think it's it. just it, there's so many cool elements to it. It, it works because his action sequences are a lot of handheld, uh, you know, uh, shots. And then, of course, he does these grand, you know, these wide shots, these establishing shots that are just, you know, uh, I, I wish there was kind of a better restoration on this because I think that there are so many great shots in this film. It's just it really is kind of breathtaking. Yeah, Navajo Joe kicks ass, man. It's just it's just so much. You know, I, I want people to kind of give it another chance. Or if you haven't watched it, watch it because it's it's a, a kick ass it's a kick ass action film. Yep. With and, a, you know a real fucking quintessential Corbucci downer ending where you're at one point going, Fuck yeah, that was so rad and at the same time going, Fuck no <laughs> Um as Navajo Joe. Uh again, spoilers on this podcast fucking dies theoretically dies i mean i guess we don't really see him die but the the point is there his horse comes back with just the money 
They take it. No one gives a shit that he died saving them from Duncan, except for the one, the one servant lady. And yeah, well, I think that goes in. That is not something where they want to make a downer ending. I think that's a message. Oh yeah, I like, mean it's definitely a message, you know, but it's yeah, that's the thing I like about, and, and I think it's a hard hitting message, and that's I believe that is a hundred percent DeLeo. That I think DeLeo should be credited for writing the beginning and end to this movie because, like, if you took as a as a crime drama, that's how DeLeo's films are. Your bad guy ends up getting into some shit in the very beginning that's heavy, and then your hero fucking dies. You know, gets shot in the face or some shit. Um, and that's and it is exactly what you know the Navajo Joe is. But yeah. Um, and then obviously, you know, Tarantino loves it. I mean, it's just that, that score. Like, I just don't know. I can't think of too many scores. Because at first, when you first hear it, you have, you know, your, your, your chanting, your loud chant scream. Yeah, the sort of and it's, uh, Native and it's American very like, scream. Yeah, it chants. just kind of shakes you at first. It's like, what is that? And then it just goes into this doom, 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 doom. And it's just... Then it gets like a little tribal, and it's just I don't know. It's, and it's, they just say Navajo a... Joe a thousand times, <laughs> something that <laughs> yeah. I did not notice like until halfway through my second watch. Somehow, um, <laughs> Navajo Joe, Nava. Yeah, I. Yeah. I don't know how I missed it, but uh, this it's actually good. is a brilliant segue into the Mercenary because uh, Navajo Joe, amazing score. The Mercenary, also. An amazing score and actually while i love everything in navajo joe score wise um i think la rena uh from the mercenary which is the song that's used in kill bill uh when the bride's um being uh, put in the coffin and when she i think when she gets out of the coffin too One of my absolute favorite songs and played during uh, one of, I would say, probably one of my favorite showdowns uh, in, a, in a spaghetti western as well, um, just because of how kind of quirky it is. Uh, I guess start at the end, much like the film does. Uh, so The Mercenary, as we said, probably one of Corbucci's more beloved uh, fun westerns, uh, definitely his most beloved uh, Zapata. Zapata? So the film starts off in this uh, rodeo in the middle of nowhere, and we have uh, one of our people that will be, be our protagonist, played by, uh, is this Thomas Million or this is, no, no, Thomas Million is the next one. Uh, this is, um, isn't it Tony Musante? I don't know how to say his last name. Let's Musante. Say. We'll just say Musante. Yeah, I'm going to say Musante. It's probably Musante. Yeah. yeah. I kept, when I was like talking about this to some friends, I kept getting Tony Musante and Thomas Million confused. Not because they're all that similar, but because they play the exact same character in two yeah, very yeah, similar yeah. movies. Cuban American playing a Mexican. Uh, not as bad as, as, as Burt Reynolds as a Native American, so I'll take it. So, uh, so Tony Musante playing uh, Paco, this um, revolutionary who starts off kind of. Uh, just uh, for the glory, you know, for the the money and the and the bitches, uh, revolutionary who turns into a well, true and proper revolutionary throughout the film. Um, although never quite stops being comic relief. But Paco, uh, he's in this rodeo. He's a rodeo clown, um, and we see in the stands. We see those beautiful, fucking sexy ass eyes, that chiseled face, that weird facial hair. Uh, it is the one, the only Franco Nero, Django himself, uh, in the stands watching, and we'll come to learn that he is a Polish man, which um, not how Polish people sound, but they wanted Franco, Fra Franco. I think Franco Nero wanted to use his own voice in the dubbing, and they wanted to, I guess, hide the fact that he was Italian. I don't know why. No, um, Nero requested. It was a personal request from from Nero. He. Because when he was in his earlier films, he was dubbed over, and he hated that. So he requested he always plays an immigrant, whether it's Polish, and he plays a Swede. Yeah, they, they call him the Sweden, you know, Campanero. So it was actually a request by Nero to play an immigrant when he was uh, one, so he could voice himself, 
because he could change his voice a tiny bit, even though he sounds the same, like in most of his films. But he wanted to always play uh, an immigrant uh, because he hated the idea of being dubbed over. So that was actually like contractual. If you wanted Nero, he had to play an immigrant and he would come up with his own names for the characters. That's amazing. So it, it yeah, the screenwriters didn't make up Nero's name. Nero, Nero made it up himself every time. That was just part of his thing. So we're at, okay. So we're at this rodeo. We got this Polish guy and then he flashes back, um, gives a little bit of narration to his time, uh, coming into this little Mexican town to, um, uh, basically just sell weapons uh, that's his his big thing. This is almost I, I'm kind of sad. There's not another uh, film where he plays this immigrant weapons dealer helping revolutionary for <laughs> Corbucci because then we could have uh, the like immigrant trilogy. And we, um, but anyway, I, I, that's one. That's uh, when I was watching these movies, I was just like, oh, this could be the, the, such a great trilogy. But now it's, it's just a beautiful duology. So um, we go to this town. Zapata Westerns, by the way, for those who don't know uh, what a Zapata Western is, it's it is a spaghetti western, but uh, it's always they're always set during the Mexican Revolution. Um, and the beautiful thing, yeah, about around Mexican the nineteen nineteen tens. Yeah, and uh, yeah. not only does this give us uh, a little bit closer to present day technology and what have you, but uh, it also allows for these Italian writers and directors to talk about fascism and uh, other such things that you probably shouldn't talk about at this point in history in uh, in Italy. How about you shut the fuck up, guys, and just calm down. Um, gives them an outlet to uh, rage against the machine, as it were. Uh, and, uh, and I think Sergio Leone probably does this to the greatest extent in um, uh, Duck, You Sucker, uh, <laughs> which is a, so a phrase that he thought that Americans said. Uh, and good for him. You know what? G good for you, Leone. But anyway, so this uh, this is uh, our first of two Zapata westerns that uh, Tarantino apparently just fucking really loves, and uh, for good reason. Uh, what we get af once once our hero uh, strolls into town, anti-hero, I guess he's uh, given this basically quest to find the uh, revolutionary who is this peaceful revolutionary um, played once again by, um, or is that Companeros? Shit. God damn it. Yeah, Com Companeros has uh, oh, I'm already getting his, confused. his buddy. Just making that. Right, up. because Companeros is the one where it starts off with him putting the dynamite in the train car. The mercenary. Um, yeah. No, this is, God damn it, I did it. Shit. <laughs> this is this is fun. Uh, I like this part. <laughs> Is, uh, is 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 watching watching the struggle yeah um okay so i basically have been describing the plot of compañeros but with tony masanti minus the beginning which does in fact take place at a rodeo in the mercenary <laughs> okay so franco nero plays a mercenary who is sent on a, a, a job and uh he crosses paths with jack palance's curly who's another mercenary I really that's his should... american rival who's yes it's his american rival yeah. so he's he's this polish guy uh, he has, yeah, so he's he's he paired up with the, the dude from, um, you know, the 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 mine, mine. I guess they work in a mine, um, and then also they pick up uh, uh, the girl who's a servant, and then they lead the the Mexican Revolution. Yes, uh, the mercenary for me it 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 works probably best because of uh, our main villain. Well, actually, I guess I guess Curly isn't really the main villain. Uh, really, it's the general played by uh, the same guy from uh, Django. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm just losing all of my names. Uh, Eduardo Fajardo? Fe Fe Fajardo? I don't know. <laughs> There's a J in there. I don't know. Um, but he played Major Jackson in Django. Um, but he plays this... Garcia. Yes, Garcia. What's really interesting about the mercenary and compañeros, it seems like in the script, the general is made out to be far more interesting of a villain than fuck. Is he even a general in this or is he just a land guy? No, he's a general. Cause he has I, troops. Yeah. I, he has some type of leadership, but I don't know if they call him a general. Yeah. Cause they own the money. You know, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's all coming back to me now. It's all coming back. So, all right. Okay. Okay. All, all right. It's all coming back to me. It's all coming. <laughs> yeah. So Paco works at this mine. Uh, and he's fed up. He's pissed off. And he does he feed Garcia the lizard, or is it some other guy? They all look the same to me. 
but he feeds a, his boss a lizard and is like, fuck y'all bitches. I'm done. I'm done with this shit. And he, start, he tries to start a revolution and it does not work out great for him, but he winds up escaping with some other dudes. Then we concurrently have Curly uh, going uh, after... Well, he's already linked up with, with Franco Nero. And it's the, the, it's because at the they meet at the bar, and um, he, you know, the the guys are like playing uh, like poker dice, whatever it is, and then he makes the guy swallow the dice. Right, and then he's gonna kill. And then Franco. that's when they have the interaction with Curly, mm-hmm. and that's one of uh, Curly's guys, and he wants to kill, you know, the Polish guy, and he says not here, and they're gonna go get him later. Right. So it's actually just, you know, then he meets up with Paco. So there's like there's like three different things, well, two different things kind of going on at, at, at this point in time. I mean, mainly it's your immigrant rolling through town, uh, makes a stir of something he sees wrong, um, and then helps out a fellow person very much like in uh, Compañeros, you know, becoming friends. Um, but yeah, no, it's because, you know, in, what you're saying is that like Paco's, they're eating because they're working, and then they just have beans. And he says, "Don't art like one day a week? Aren't we supposed to get meat or something?" And then they hold up the lizard, saying, "Here's your meat." And that's kind of what sparks the anger. <laughs> it's true. No difference between rich and poor here, huh? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> After you eat that, you'll be able to stomach anything. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the character of uh, it was Kowalski, which is the uh, name of the dude in the Vanishing Point, in Vanishing Point. But, uh, yeah, Kowalski sees that and then pairs up. And they basically start this mini revolution that becomes bigger because he has access to, you know, more weapons. And also very good at tactical stuff and infiltration because they do that a few times in the movie. Uh, you know, they pose as because they pose as re- like in a religious parade at one point. I, I think that's also said with uh, with with the servant girl that that pairs with them because she sees them stealing from people, and it's just not about money. But yeah, they're just paying him to become, you know, part of their team, and they they do develop. You know a friendship um well they they are they are friends and then it's just that curly is hired to hunt them down yeah and it's sort of a good um, the bad and the ugly scenario you have uh, the good yeah. of course being franco nero which clint eastwood in that movie um you have the ugly is paco and then you have uh curly who is uh the bad and oh he's so bad i love i love curly so much he's the standout for me you play by the rules, you lose. Probably the only problem with Curly is he's not in the movie enough. Well, you get him as the villain in Compañero. So. We do, but he's he's a little <laughs> different. He's not as gay. Um, I think one thing I love Ooh. about Jack Palance in his Italian ventures uh, is he's obviously not just in it for a paycheck. He is going over there, and yeah, he's you know getting money, but he's putting his all into these characters. Whenever he's given these opportunities, he makes the most of them. So with Curly, okay, here's this villain, and he he's gay. He has this uh, lover who is killed, and he has to cry over. Um, at one point, he's stripped naked and sent off uh, into the desert, and it's one of those characters where very easily it could turn offensive. And I guess it is maybe a little offensive at times, but he never plays into the camp. He always has a dignity to him uh, to the very end, despite being a total piece of shit. Probably my, one of my favorite moments is when he is stripped naked and sent off because he, he could have broken down. He could have been very fey about it, but he just has like the, he just like, you know, chest out, fine. If I'm going to walk away naked, I'm going to walk away naked. He even hands him the last of his clothes and he just walks away and they're all laughing at him, but he just knows it's okay because I'm going to get my vengeance. And it is just such like powerful character work. And especially, you know, for this time period to have him be such a powerful character and to not play into any stereotypes is just really, it's really uh, refreshing and it's really 
uh, enjoyable to watch. It's very entertaining. And it kind of turns into my one problem with the movie, which I'm going to pe- skip all the way to the end. So they, they circle back around. You get this big revolutionary struggle. They have this big sequence where they, um, uh, I guess they, it's either a compound or a small town that the mining company has taken over or whatever. But they attack them. They more or less win, but they have to run off and hide. Both he and the Polak got away and went north. I will get them. And then we cut to five or six months later, and Paco's, you know, being a rodeo clown. He's been tracked down uh, by Kowalski. And the rodeo finishes up, and lo and behold, there's Curly, uh, who's tracked them down as well, and is there to kill Paco. But Kowalski sets up a little duel between the two of them, and it, therein enters Larina, the, the amazing piece of music that uh, just rocks my fucking socks, like almost puts the big cemetery uh, finale in Good, the Bad, and the Ugly to shame. Almost, not quite, but almost does. <laughs> Curly's killed. It's a very... Um, it's a somewhat silly death because he gets, sh- like, you get the usual, like, Paco falls down. He's been shot in, like, the shoulder or something. And then Curly, you think, oh, shit, Curly's won. But then, oh, what's that? His gun falls from his hand and his flower that he's been wearing on his lapel this entire movie starts bleeding. It's a bit silly, but the movie itself uh, has a very comic tone throughout. Uh, he falls dead. And right then... Like, you could end the movie and you'd be pretty good. Like, there's a few loose ends, but if you, like, you know, work those into the previous sequences, it could easily just be the finale right then and there. You could cut to credits, beautiful, rah, rah, I love it. But, didn't do that. See, the uh, the main dude, uh, Garcia, is still alive. Uh, he's out there, and so we got to get rid of that uh, loose end. So our two guys are uh, brought in. Uh, because they're both wanted, and we get like uh, probably like 15 more minutes of movie. And it's my one problem with the mercenary is it really it doesn't need those 15 minutes. Like what happens in those 15 minutes is cool, and it has a solid ending where they shoot down Garcia and his men on horseback on a hill, and they fall down the hill. It's beautiful. But once Curly's dead, like that's your big bad. That's 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 where you finish things off, and it the movie as a whole has a ton of great moments. Um, there's Franco Nero using a hooker's boobs to light a match, amazing. Oh, he also uses the boot of a hanged man. He enters this room full of hanged men. There's like three or four hanged dudes, and he just uses one of their boots casually to light a match because he's a fucking baller, and that's what you do. You use the boots of dead guys. He also uses he uses a bare foot one time, doesn't he? He does. He can, he can fucking light a match with anything. He uses a uh, prostitute's body to explain revolution to Paco. The revolution attempts unity. That means to bring the behind and the head together. Um, in that the head is the rich, the lower parts, a.k.a. that sweet ass, um, is the, are the poor. And the two parts that they have to be brought together, but it's impossible because of what's between them. And that's not only a beautiful metaphor, but a hilarious one. There's a lot of, there's a ton of scenes that are just, isn't Franco Nero cool? Isn't he just the most baller ass motherfucker you ever been around? Uh, he orders this feast at this inn or whatever, just because he knows that the revolutionaries are going to, uh, come, like, are going to follow him because they need him. Then, uh, and then of course they do show up and they all have a great feast. Um, there's Paco, uh, charging, uh, in like a bull when he thinks that this gringo is having sex with the, with his like perceived woman, um, who herself is this revolutionary who's dedicated to the cause who Paco throughout his, like his actions in the movie slowly wins over. Like it's, it's full of moments. I Again, I cannot, if you asked me, even after we just talked about it, to recall the entire plot in detail, couldn't do it. Uh, it's just like, it's one of those movies where I would need to watch it like another one or two times to really, or at least more recently, to really tell Probably you. Probably shouldn't have paired Companeros with the Mercenary together. It is, they're very similar films. Um, so, but uh, yeah, you know, you're saying about the the, 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 the script and, and, and the writing is, uh, the, the writer of this wrote, 
uh, for a few dollars more, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Also wrote Arnold Schwarzenegger's Raw Deal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, Lu- Lucio uh, Venizoli, I believe. I can't think of Ven- Vincenzoni, I think is how you pronounce it. I, I, I'm i drawing a blank. But um, yeah, it, he's uh, he has a way of of doing these um, scripts, making your lead character just kind of, I don't know, just incredibly charming and funny. And that's what, I mean, Corbucci liked that, too. I mean, he he casted, you know, Thomas Millian and, and Franco Nero in a lot of his films because uh, he made them laugh, or he, they, they made Corbucci laugh. And that's essentially what they were doing. They were making these buddy action movies um, that had serious moments, but ultimately they were just having a very good time. Well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was before I knew you, Pollock. And they've said that countless times. I mean, Thomas Millian and Nero were, were great friends. Um, and, and Nero loved Corbucci. He even dedicated movies that Nero wasn't in to, uh, to, to Nero. So a lot of that carries over to these two films in particular. That um, It's kind of funny he didn't cast him as the Indian in Navajo Joe now that I think about it. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but anyway, that's that's it's, that's a, um, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like you know he 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 loved his eyes. Those are some sexy you know eyes. he 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 constantly you know had uh, the DPs know that they need needed to focus on on his eyes and um, and of course uh, another thing that Nero did is he had his own makeup person so like he wouldn't use on set makeup. He had his own makeup person that traveled with him wherever. Cause he always did this thing that he was made to look older. So there's a lot of close-ups and you could see like the wrinkles on Nero's face. And he, he's not that old. Yeah. He just wanted to stay the same age for the longest. Yeah. He he just, he just keeps saying they have all these wrinkles and stuff, which I always found really funny there's an interview with him somewhere that discusses that but yeah i I think it's uh i think that's really funny both films the reason why i paired them together is because they both they kind of feel like sequels in like this really weird way in this other world but well um, yeah they have that dollars kind of thing going where it's a very similar character or well two similar characters in this case yeah. But they're not not quite. Um, and you could, you know, maybe try to come up with some conspiracy theory just like they do with the Dollars trilogy. But in the end, you know, it's just different stories uh, with very similar archetypes with the same actors. And um, I'm just going to I'm going to throw out this hot take. I wish Franco Nero was in Fistful of Dollars. Just saying, just saying. Uh, anyway, so uh, by the way, it's Luciano Vincenzoni. Uh, is I believe the uh, oh thank up. thank you for that Luciano um, but, only. but this is uh, a course shot by which I mentioned earlier Alejandro uh, Yulia I believe is how you say it but Did Yulia I mean one he loves his zooms zooms in and zooms out because that is something he constantly uses which I don't really care for in films like this especially if it's not really like if it's not like an impactful scene. It's just constantly doing this. But anyways, I mean, obviously, he was one of uh, the top Italian DPs. He's worked with, of course, Corbucci, Lindsay, uh, Margheriti, um, uh, Castellari, uh, Paul Nashi, uh, Lucio Fulci. He's, he worked with all these guys, and he has shot some great films. Like Conquest. And, and The Devil's Honey. And The yeah. Devil's Honey. Two, of, yeah. two, another hot take. Two of Lucio Fulci's best films, and then I mean, of course, again, he was the DP on uh, on Campaneros. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, it does have a good. It always his films have a good look, and it works for this picture in particular for for what he is. He is a good DP, but I don't. The only criticism I have is in um, the mercenary. Is the zoom in and zoom out? It's it's consistent, and I don't I don't get it. I don't know why that was uh, chosen, especially when it's not like, oh hey, look at that person, zoom. 
I think, I mean, it does or, add a certain kinetic energy to it, but I would say also if you compare Navajo Joe and either of these two films, Navajo Joe is the superior just looking film. And even besides yeah. the zooms, it's just a more well-composed film. But the cool things are, is like you said, the, the, the score, which is done by Morricone and uh, Bruno uh, Ni Nicolai, Ni Nicolai, Nicolai. Yeah, um, I think Nicolai. Who, who did a ton of Giallo scores. Yeah. And then it, this is also... Um, you know, edited by a guy that did a ton of Giallo, uh, U U Eugene, Eugenio Ala Alabiso, I think is how you say it, Eugenio Alabiso, who edited, you know, uh, basically the dollars. Uh, I don't know if he edited The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, but I know he did for a few dollars more of this full of dollars. He did The Good, Bad, and The Ugly. Um, so, yeah, and he did, you know, edited Companeros, which, again, is basically the same team of people that did did both films. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, I, I do feel the movie is tight. Um, aside again, I think the whole last act is a little wonky because I feel that they could have made this one big scene of it ending rather than like have two endings. Yeah. I'm not even sure um, that the, like the narrative, like the device of having the, uh, the flashbacks is necessary at all. It doesn't really add anything other than like, yeah tell you that these two characters are going to survive that's about it um yeah so there's definitely uh yeah it's it's structurally a little it's the weakest structurally of the three films um yeah i would say it's probably also my least favorite of the three but i mean it they're all really solid films like it's not that's not really saying much um, yeah and, and you know a thing that they that they uh it's it's easy to overlook but it's I don't. I would like to know if it was something that Nero made up on, by himself. But there's a moment in the film where he first meets Paco, and they're like in the bar, and Nero's eating like his steak, and everybody else is doing like random shit. You know, he goes up and he and he says, you know, he's like, "Yay for the immigrant!" He's like throwing the salt, you know, and he's like, "Celebrate, celebrate!" You know. And then there's a shot where it goes back and it's the wide, wide shot of the bar and Nero's like trying to enjoy his food, but he chucks some salt over his right shoulder and it's never mentioned that he does it. They don't say anything about it, but it also says that our character is superstitious, which doesn't come back into play at all in this film. And it's a scene that always kind of, really got me because i'm like what is the point of that is the character superstitious or is nero doing something himself or is nero superstitious i don't know it's just it's it's one of those like little added bonus things that put a little bit more depth into the character you know whether you're superstitious or, superstitious or not it's just a really quick sequence that has always got me the fa I mean, he does like luck out a lot. That's like a trait of this character. And when he, when that yeah. character is reborn with a different uh, nationality in the next film, very lucky. Um, so maybe there's something to that. It does seem like yeah. one of those little uh, touches that Nero would just add to the character for the sake of it. Here's to you, gringo. <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and this because this is going a little long. Um, let's go ahead and dig into Compañeros, uh, a film that I've already given the plot to. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, Compañeros, uh, even simpler, I would say. They basically um, are so they're going to get it's Commander okay. Ray, who is this like, oh, let's all be peaceful, no, don't kill, uh, intellectual revolutionary. Uh, something that just doesn't work, according to Corbucci in this film. But sometimes you have to use violence, Professor. I deny that. Give me one single case where violence is absolutely necessary. Yours. <laughs> they need him so that they can open the safe back in this Mexican town. And uh, in theory, Franco will get a lot of money while also selling weapons. And, uh, well, uh, things don't go quite as planned. He winds up kind of sucked into the revolution more than he probably wanted to be. Uh, but in the, in the, uh, under the, in the course of this, uh, adventure that they go on, uh, he teaches, uh, Thomas Millian's, oh shoot, what's his name in this? Thomas Millian plays, uh, 
El El Vasco. El Vasco. Yeah. Um, or to Vasco, as I shall uh, probably refer to him at some point. Take, he he helps Vasco to become a real revolutionary and not just some puppet, because basically what Vasco is doing is just like acting like a big shot while the general's away. And then, like, as soon as the general comes back, he gets uh, demoted. I hereby strip you of all rank, and you should be thankful I'm not stripping your stupid jackass head from your stupid no-good shoulders, you stupid idiot! Now get out of here! And uh, he almost, actually, almost kills the Swede, played by Franco Nero. He buries him up to his head, which is also done in The Mercenary. And uh, luckily, the general comes, and uh, Franco, or uh, the Swede, is saved. And uh, long story short, they wind up going after uh, and bringing back Fernando Rey's peaceful revolutionary, but things don't go quite as planned, and Franco Nero, Swede, and um, Vasco uh, turn on the general and decide to do what's right and all that jazz, and, you know, it's okay because the Swede can still get his money, uh, but lo and behold, at the very end, he opens up the safe and... Our labor, our soil, our grain. It's all we have. All our wealth is there. And it's literally just a safe with a metaphor in it, <laughs> and which is such a great fuck you. From that point, uh, we all, all we have left to do is to kill Fernando Rey, um, because you can't have a peaceful revolutionary. That's just not how it works. <laughs> After he's killed, we also kill uh, our great villain, played once again by Jack Palance. Uh, this time, he plays John. And John... So, I loved Curly. Curly's great. John is a whole different level of metal. Because John, he was a former partner uh, or associate of the Swede. And the Swede left him to die. Uh, I think he was crucified. John has this pet hawk named Marcia. It was Marcia. She was the only one I had left. She saved me from the nail that pinned my flesh to the tree. <laughs> How? Pulled the nail loose with her beak? <laughs> no. No. No, she ate off my hand. <laughs> and he, the whole movie has a wooden hand and just dotes on this fucking bird until eventually the bird is captured and roasted by Vasco. Uh, and so instead of having a gay lover that he weeps over, he has this bird that he might fuck. I don't know. We don't see it on screen. And it is one of the most beautiful relationships of any villain and his pet <laughs> that I've ever seen. The way that it, that Campaneros... Campaneros has several things to, to better the formula crafted in The Mercenary. First off, it has a baller-ass theme song. Uh, Camponier. I can't actually do it. I can't sing. But the point oh, is. Oh wow, it's very, it's very good. Yeah. Um, it's 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 a fantastic song that plays uh, several times throughout the film. Compañero! Thank goodness, because it uh, slaps. It is straight lit, fam. Uh, the plot is far more streamlined. Uh, it's a very simple get to this guy, bring him back. Uh, and in the midst, we'll have character growth and do revolutionary nonsense. Fantastic. Uh, we have a lot of, um, a lot sort of deeper subtext throughout about uh, communism and fascism uh, and what a revolutionary, what, you know, is necessary in a revolution, which I think is, it, it adds a little bit more weight to the proceedings without, you know, really adding too much plot wise, maybe a few more, uh, like philosophical conversations that some people might like, but a lot of them involve Fernando Ray. So it, it works. And then the most important thing is it doesn't have a messy third act. You have general Mongo, who is a much more interesting secondary villain this time. You could, I guess, be forgiven for mistaking him as just like a bumbling uh, revolutionary general uh, at first, but it, it, turn it turns out that he is this coward who's just in it for money, uh, which is, again, very much feels like a criticism of many uh, fascist dictators. He's killed off in a very uh, thematically rich way, He's just shot down in the streets as he as he deserves. And then 
after this less interesting villain is killed, John comes back into play. And this might be the greatest borderline ridiculous setup of any film ever. The film starts with the Swede, played by Franco Nero, putting dynamite in a boxcar. I still don't... Is there any reason that he, that he has for doing that at the beginning? Yeah, I think it's a backup. Because I, I think of it as kind of um, like in Ronin. Like there's a scene in Ronin where Robert De Niro's character gets to the restaurant first. And he like goes behind the restaurant and he puts like a gun like in a plant. And then he goes inside. And the gun's never used. It's just a way the character shows that he is always prepared. And this is his like oh fuck situation. That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, that that's, um, that's how I took it. But I wasn't every so often I miss I miss some context, and then like I, I feel like. But they also the put the dynamite in the car in the mercenary. But anyway, so he puts dynamite in the beginning, and ha what happens? John is standing above everyone. He kills Fernando Ray uh, as he should, and uh, he's standing on this box car above everyone else ready to dole out his vengeance. And, uh, well, the Swede doesn't ha take kindly to that, and he sets off the dynamite and blows John to fuck all. Uh, it is one of those glorious takedowns of a villain, and then his fucking wooden hand is all that's left. It just comes down. Uh, Flops think, down right in front of him. <laughs> yeah, perfectly placed. And that's basically the end of the movie. Like, uh, we, he, he kind of, like, he goes off to leave, and then he runs back, ready to do more revolution. But essentially, like, within a minute, minute and a half, the movie's over. Perfect ending to uh, a Zapata Western. You have, like, a phenomenal, fiery finale. This one also has a bookend, but it's less, really less notable. I don't think you really, like, I, I, I keep, I only just remembered that there's a book ending device because it starts with the Swede and Vasco um, ready to, to, to duel and then it never really comes it amounts to anything I think that's when John arrives and kind of stops the proceeding so it doesn't really go anywhere other than to I guess have a book end I, I don't really narratively it doesn't really work that well but um, it's also so minor that who cares yeah I don't really have much in the way of notes santos actually uh uh fernando ray's character has one of my favorite lines uh mostly because it's one of my political views uh which is uh nationalism is always the sign of fear um i think that's a great line uh one of the few and uh, uh, one thing i really like is santos while he is wrong as far as how he approaches revolution is full of wisdom and what we wind up with is a mix of philosophies in the end, I mean, it does kind of call for violence, but it does show um, that you have to have some humanity and um, you have to actually be fighting for something worthwhile, um, like the aforementioned labor, soil, and grain, uh, and not just be a, a, a sad little capitalist pig like General Mongo. And uh, yeah, um, you know, you got... Oh, you also have a, a gag running throughout um, about that silver dollar, which I think winds up saving Vasco's life, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, which also kind of uh, fits into that luck thing with the salt. Like, there's still yeah, a little may luck. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's kind of what, uh, you know, you know the, these... Because I, like I said, it just, it feel, they feel like sequels at times. And like the whole, like I said, the salt thing and the mercenary just kind of, just kind of works. Um, but um, to, to kind of go back to a little bit is, is um, you know, with, with the score uh, for these films, uh, you know, any of all over the place with, with these. But in particular, these two Corbucci films, um, you know, ma mainly made back to back. And, and I think everybody's trying to achieve the success of, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly and, and these very popular Westerns. Uh, with uh, that are just kind of dominating the box office worldwide, um, you know, in, 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 all, in all these different countries. And, um, you know, he does, like, he has a little bit, not sure what it is, but there's something different about these scores that, because even though Morcone is fantastic, hands down, 
probably the best composer of all time, uh, especially like scores for his movies. Um, there is something with these films in particular that kind of define like it's a Corbucci film. And it's not Corbucci style of filmmaking either. It's, it's almost like his scores are identifiable to these Corbucci films. And uh, he's got to be, there's got to be something where he's very like, Ennio knows what he's doing instead of making these, you know, because he's doing the scores for all these Westerns. You know, he's the go-to guy. He's, he's doing it all. But he's able, like, I mean, most, like, a lot of, musicians a lot of composers they have a style and um their style's good and it works but we can also identify those styles i mean it's the same thing with carpenter carpenter's amazing at his scores but they sound similar we know when it's carpenter corbut uh uh morricone doesn't really do that it's almost like he looks at the director and defines his music based off their math, like their work in general. And that's kind of what I think he's doing. And I don't know if there's an interview, maybe I'm sure there's books written uh, about this and the, the probably answers there, but it's almost like he categorizes his directors and in their, in their work. And then he comes up with a score um, because they're just, they're, they're so different in style. Like the same thing, like with, with uh, the Campaneros, there's like, you know, you have the harmonica, uh, you know, that kicks in, but you also kind of have like this, like, I don't even know what to call it. Like old school, like Gregorian chant stuff that's happening, like mixed with like, like reggae in a way. Like it's just, it's, it's a very like odd score. It, it's, it, it fits the movie. But when you break it down, it's just so different. And I think that's part of, like, Corbucci's style and these spaghetti westerns. Um, but anyways, I'm kind of going off on a, on a tangent, like, encompassing all of Ineo's work. But I, I really do think, like, he says, okay, this is a Corbucci film, so this is what I'm going to do. You know, it's not like, oh, let me see the movie. I think about it in my head. This is what it's going to sound like. I know, I think he really picks his projects according to the director and then defines his music that way. Because even though all of these scores are by the same guy, they're vastly different, vastly different. And, and I think that's his way of kind of taking Corbucci's films and kind of making them their own with these scores. If that makes any sense, because if it is anything, any would, just make these grand scores that all sound the same. Each one is different, and I think that's all for uh, for Bucci. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 again, I'm not the, mu I'm not a music guy. I, I, I suck at everything involving music. But uh, when I, I've been listening to a lot of Morricone's work, uh, specifically from these films, uh, and I just made a playlist and was just like just going through it a bunch as I was working, and. Uh, you know, each one I was like, okay, there's Compañeros, okay, there's the Mercenary, okay, there's Navajo. Well, Navajo Joe is really easy because they just say his name 500 times. But yeah, I don't have anything profound to say about any of his work. Other no, than no, it, I mean, I, I just it, think he's he's taking his he's taking his score, and he's you know, because like, and I'm not trashing any composer, but sometimes you can get their work mixed up. You can just say you Goblin. hate John Williams. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah, I mean, John Williams, uh, Goblin. I mean, you take Claudio Simonetti. Like, his scores are fantastic. But a lot of these scores just kind of run together a little too much. And you have to take a second to think, oh, is that from is that, from that movie? Or Fa Fabio Frizzi is another example where, you know, is that House by the Cemetery or is that part of Zombie? Like, you have to like almost take a second to 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 kind of define these scores. And Morricone, like when you hear the thing, when you hear Navajo Joe, when you hear any of his masterworks, you know exactly what movie it is. Because that's how well he defines himself. And he does that for directors, I believe. I believe he solely does that for his directors. 
and he has a certain style. And and the same thing is like with with these like Navajo Joe Campaneros. Maybe not so much the mercenary because he brought in you know Bruno to help him, so it kind of has a different style. But they're just so bombastic and loud. And he's not doing that for Sergio Leone or some of these other films. I, I just think it's a unique process. And I'd really like to break down, you know, obviously he's, he's you know, passed away. But, um, you know, break down kind of his, like, how he envisions this stuff. Because obviously the directors have no input, I believe. No input at all. I mean, what do you tell Ennio? Make it good? No. He just <laughs> he just does like, you know, whatever he wants. So um, but anyways, yeah, it's it's a it's a very he's a very unique individual um with some incredible scores and he he amplifies these movies tenfold every time. Oh, 100%. if you took out the score to Navajo Joe, we probably wouldn't be talking about cinema of course is a is a collaborative effort blah 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 you know all, it's all all the pieces mixed together make the whole all that jazz um any morricone scores any like i think any movie that has a morricone score probably worth watching or at least listening to at least once because you are going to get something out of it um uh orally that doesn't work that joke doesn't work for the people just listening to the <laughs> podcast yeah i think uh it you know, it makes sense that Tarantino, you know, brought him in to do Hateful Eight. Uh, it makes sense that he has stolen his music for so many moments in his filmography and uh, often moments that are themselves some of the most noted in those movies. Like I think some like some of the moments in Kill Bill that I remember most are just when he's using that NEO score. The, it, like I said, it's it's almost like the the score is you know, a movie or a character itself, you know, and, and it's not too often you have composers that are able to do that, it, especially like 25 times. Like, you know, you, you have composers like, you know, you have Goblin that does like some, you know, a couple like incredible scores that are just like incredibly, just overwhelmingly beautiful and, and really well done. Fabio Frizzi the same way. but Morricone has done it countless times and it's just like you know to be that much just into it and into the music and able to create something and never sound the same is just unbelievable and I think uh, you know that kind of sums up why these projects are the first in our kill blank series um, because you know they were sampled for a good reason. Because you can't you can't beat the the master. You you dig you fella f f fucks. Um, a little neo goes a long way. We learned that in Tarantino's work. And if you take those references and you uh, go back into history and you watch these movies, you're gonna get just entire massive you know hour and a half two hour experiences bolstered by an entire soundtrack made up of this sweet, sweet, sweet musical compositions uh, that really are just about unequaled. I mean, you know, there's everyone's another favorite composer, um, but I think most modern film fans who love classic cinema put Ennio Morricone pretty, pretty goddamn motherfucking high. You, you dig? I, I, that's no, how musicians talk, it be, right? It should be number one. Should be number one. I yeah, mean, I, I, I do like other composers, but no one has the same breadth that, of of yeah, yeah. No one, no one has that that range. You hear that, Some John Williams? Have... You motherfucker! You hear it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, John Williams is great. Don't get me wrong, but you know what, John Williams score when you hear it. You do indeed. You know, and and I I don't like that per se. I, I don't like I like that with musicians in the sense of making music and hearing them grow, but I do not like that with scores to movies. Don't you prefer know, it. Let's not get the Twitter mob on us. Carpenter. Carpenter does it in a way that it works, even though they sound similar as far as like the instruments he's using. He does something a little bit different though. And I, I on a, again I don't know what it is. I it really is just a mood. 
We're gonna, um, we need to have like an actual um, musician on to talk about these things at some point. I just realized that <laughs> I need somebody who knows yeah, what the no, fuck that, you're talking that about. Actually, music. That actually might be good just because it's sometimes it's hard for me to uh, think of words to explain music because it's on something that's auditory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to explain uh, music every once in a while. But yeah, it's. I mean, music's a beautiful thing, so that's the reason why I always bring it up when I'm talking about movies. Well, it's, it's a good thing that, you know, a lot of Tarantino's references aren't music cues, you know? We lucked out <laughs> in choosing this topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's called it, it, you know, even though I like it, he's cheating is what that's called. <laughs> like, it's, it's a beautiful pastiche. If you had pastiche. anybody else make up cues for your movies, those scenes wouldn't work as well. It's uh, smart. It, it's he's, just a smart thing. He's a master of the the cinematic collage, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it it helps to introduce people to these films, uh, and I think that no, absolutely, it's a it's a gateway. Tarantino's a gateway drug. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, no. that's a very good way to put it. A gateway drug. And with that, I think we're going to end it here because it's been a long podcast, and I, I remember telling my wife on our vacation that we're on oh it'll be like maybe an hour i'm a i'm a terrible husband yeah. um <laughs> uh, so anyway uh brad i feel like everybody knows who you are you got anything going on Any, anything to plug nah i don't do that on podcasts i find a little boring okay um <laughs> <laughs> i don't either you all know if you're listening to this podcast you well you might not know who, know who i am you're probably here for brad actually uh but uh i if, hope not <laughs> i have a youtube channel and i make movies and my name is michael keen not the guitarist yeah thank you so much everybody for listening you can follow us both on the twitters um brad what's your handle on twitter just my name, Brad F. Henderson. Okay, mine's just my name, at Michael Keen. <laughs> we basic bitches over here. We all basic bitches. Anyway, thank you so much for watching or listening to this podcast, depending on your preferred preference. Uh, and until next time, guys, please, for the love of God, preferably something of the spaghetti variety, go watch a movie. Uh, Marsha, you didn't like the Swedish meat. First, you have to tell us where you hit the money. Now, will you talk? If you ever come to Sweden, I'll let you meet my sister. Beautiful eyes. You like this eye. Just like your sister, eh? See?